Hello there. Welcome to part two of the two part video guide. If you haven't checked out part one yet, it mostly focuses on my thoughts and uh, approach in making videos for this channel. Part two will be focusing on these topics on screen along with the timestamps. So if you're looking for something super specific, you know what to do. This is made for those of you who doesn't know much about the mechanics in post-production or just post-production in uh, stop motion filmmaking or just filmmaking in general. Some of the tutorial here are based on the questions that you guys sent in. So let's start off with the list of equipment. The hardware that lights all of this video in this channel to this point are two softbox lights. I purchased it online and on a cheap because it gets the job done and on a budget and it's really great for basic users. I also have this portable LED light from Newer. Newer. I don't exactly know how to pronounce it but I rarely get to use them as they can be quite harsh. They do come with diffusers but even then they are still quite strong, useful for something like an interrogation scene. Where is she? Hey, can you ask what drink does he want? So, uh, coffee or tea? For camera, I mainly use the Canon EOS 700D with the stock lens. It also has a different name to it, but basically it's the same device and also the iPhone 6S, depending on what I need to do or use it for. And the camera rig I use for the iPhone is an off-brand but is similar to the Beast Grip which I got a few years ago before the channel was made. During filming, while I mostly use Figma stands that every Figma figure comes with, uh, and I tend to stick with the ones that I already opened before, but the parts are easily replaceable if or when I need to. I also have this mini arm rig that comes with a crocodile clip. It does support most figures weight, but I rarely get to use it. In fact, the first time this was ever used was in the opening of the part 1 video guide. Links in the description if you haven't checked that one out. For audio, while I would like to say I have a proper mic, I don't. All the audio and recorded voice dub you hear is captured on the Samsung S4 with the stock app recorder mic. It works just fine and you should be able to hear me okay. For the peripheral, I use a standard basic tripod. They are not high-end like something like Manfrotto, but just like the softbox lights, it gets the job done. I also use a hanging bag as a support for the additional weight making the tripod just that a little bit more stable. The PC I use is a refurbished Ultrabook which I purchased for my uni days to set up for presentation along with my MacBook Air. On the Ultrabook, I use the Dragon Frame 4 software to animate and Final Cut Pro 10 in post-production on the MacBook Air. While my preferred software is Final Cut Pro, I used to experiment with Premiere Pro, Photoshop and GIMP in the past on PC. But over time I found that the software that suits my needs better than others and I settled with Final Cut for most of my video editing needs for its stream of conscious editing. My own workflow might be quite chaotic for some but personally I find that both operating system works for specific purposes and honestly I don't prefer one over the other. They both serve a very specific purpose for me and they are both great platforms to work with. In part 1 I talk about how I structure the videos for the channel but I didn't really mention what to do from there so let's start from the setup. When you have a video idea and ready to shoot your video, the next thing is to decide on a space or a location and light them properly. Now unless you want to show a black screen or a complete darkness, you'll need to light your subject in order for you the animator to animate, the editor to edit and the viewer that is you to watch. After making many videos experimenting, I can tell you that I have experimented with flashlight, a table light, um, LED lights for filming and even sunlight and now the light that I use from the softbox. What I can tell you is that while every light can be used, you also have to keep in mind that it does have its shortcoming regardless whatever option that you choose. 
which includes the space to house the, a larger light equipment, the cost, or even if you decide to use a free option, which is the sunlight, you will either have to film in short amount of time or risk your footage having flickers like this uh, that can ruin your images from the clouds and the shadows that you might not be able to see properly, which is not ideal in most circumstances. So be careful with that. But if you're looking for something extremely basic to practice with, uh, any light setup will be just as good uh, from a table light uh, or just a single softbox. But as you get better, especially if you have a small budget to work with, you might want something that looks a little bit more decent and from there you might want to use a two-point lighting or a three-point light to light your subject or scene well. Now, similar to traditional filmmaking, it does depend what you want the lights to do for you or what type of look or style you're going for. But unlike traditional filmmaking, you will need to consider your working station if it requires you to move in and out to animate your subject or object in your shot. And if this applies to you while animating, remember to look out for equipment around you, especially if there's wires or cable on the floor to avoid tripping hazards and any shadows that can cast from yourself or from your own setup. Wearing black is also ideal and generally the safest route to avoid this completely, assuming you're not in the way, but I find as long as you don't wear anything that reflects light from yourself or you don't have anything like a wash or a jewelry to reflect light, you're good to go. When you have your lights set up, the next thing you'll need if you don't already have is a stable footing for your capture device uh, so that your video don't look like this. This can be achieved through several means like a tripod or a rig or whatever you can think of as long as it's safe, stable and doesn't damage your own equipment. Don't do what I do folks. But maybe you don't have a tripod or an expensive rig like this to ground your device or camera. And while I have tried a method in the past, this method that you see on screen now, I don't really recommend it unless you're in an absolute pinch. You can use a blue tag or a white tag or tack it or whatever you call this um, that's safe, clean to place your phone in like so and use a heavy box or anything that's uh, that's like it to hold your smartphone if you're using your smartphone upright. It's not something that I would use on a regular but if you have a smartphone and that is your only capturing device and you're working from an absolute zero budget this is one of the many ways you can go about it and reduce any unwanted movement in your footage. If you're using a smartphone with the free stop motion app, um, be careful when touching the screen or avoid them altogether by using an earphone or a headphone that has a volume click button whenever possible as the volume uh, button can serve as a shutter for most application. And while it does work on some headphones, I find that many third parties um, earphone might not work so your mileage may vary there. As I don't have any animation background, how I animate video for the channel is a process of trial and error. And through that process, I have my own way of animating. The methods I use to animate is a mixture of the 12 principles of animating by Ollie Johnston and Frank Thomas, along with some classical theatre staging methods as well as my very own instinct to coordinate movement. When animating movement at any scale, be it gesture or action heavy, I personally like to animate them in a series of rhythm. You know how dancers deconstruct their movement in beats? Or if you watch any dance tutorial video, you probably heard something like this. Up, Here's an example of how I animate in real time while doing my best explaining my own process. This is going to be an unscripted uh, explanation in my process in live animation. So, what it could, we'll just move that slowly, ease a little bit in and take shot. 
and then we'll do another one this one is a little bit longer so second so if we go by beats it will go like one two and then third uh third frame fourth frame and then by this time we should be easing out so that um it looks good right let's do that so if we were to play it uh, just one more and then we do a follow through so technically i would end here but because i want to follow through it it will do that just very subtly so that's it. Uh, I hope that was useful. I don't know if it's gonna do well, but there you go. Well, that's basically how I animate. Uh, every action has a beat and every set of movement has a rhythm of its own, which essentially becomes like a dance of sorts. And this is why stop motion animators love articulation on their figures or puppets because it allows us the animator to apply the 12th principle of animating and give it life because unlike illustration or 2D animation, physical articulation is the very few ways we can express our work and animate them. Let's change gears and talk about scale. While having multiple articulations or from an object or figure does make it easier for you, the animator, uh, the difficulty can also vary depending on the scale of the object itself and sometimes your finger will have trouble getting into the figure or object without ruining your own setup and breaking continuity. And like the surgeon's scalpel, if you're animating with something small, Having a small tool like a skewer might be useful having it nearby to get into that hard to reach uh, places for you to manipulate. So look at everyday objects around you and see how you can use them as an extension of yourself when animating. Here's a tip that I learned from Justin who is one of the people who inspired me to do stop motion videos. A good tip if you want to know how much frame you're going to need to film roughly during the course of your filming process is to use something like a timer. You can use your phone for this or if you have a special device, that's fine too. What you're going to do with the timer is just record yourself or just imagine yourself as the subject that moves around in the video. Let's say if you're working with 12 frames per second and it takes you 2 seconds or 5 seconds to complete each clip or video, this will hopefully help you to eliminate some of the guesswork that you need to do and also build a pacing and timing for your own video. Because it's a great reference point, it helps you to plan for your own videos or your own schedule if you need to tell someone how much frame you're going to need or just a reference for yourself. Here's the tip on animating. Earlier when I talk about the list of equipment, I mentioned that I have this arm rig with the crocodile clip. Instead of drilling the figure and attaching some clip to grip, I mean come on, how are you supposed to clip onto that? I unscrew one of the Figma stands attachment and use that as a grip for the clip to hold on to it. And if you purchase something similar, you can use this solution without any additional modification and potentially break your own expensive figures. Here's another tip when filming with arm rigs. If you do decide to use an arm rig, always take a blank shot without the subject and rig of the scene that you're working if you do decide to edit out the rig in post. This has saved me many hours in the past and when I do forget to do it, I spend a lot of hours and time in post. And on the topic of editing in stop motion animation, let's move on to the last topic for this video. Now as mentioned earlier, my preferred video editing tool is Final Cut Pro 10. So I'll be explaining my process through it. Now the main tool we're gonna be using here is a feature called the mask tool. And since I don't know what exactly what type of video editing software that you personally like to use, it's a feature that allows you to cover up or conceal or replace a certain part of the image in your footage. 
Even though different video editing software has a different name to this exact same function, it generally works the same way and you can apply this concept to your own workflow to remove some of the rigs and also anything that you would like for your own video. What I'm doing on screen right now is basically using the blank shot. In this case, it's the same footage but minus the arm rig and also the subject itself. In this case, it's body kun as a mask. And if you're using Final Cut Pro, uh, just head over to the effect browser and scroll down to find the mask tool or just type in the key, uh, search bar mask and you'll find the mask tool drag and drop or just double click on it so that it applies to the footage that you want to use as a mask and from there what you'll need to do is just um, key in all the points that you want to cover because it is a mask and you want to tell the editing software that you want this particular spot to be masked or covered um, from there, what you'll need to do so that it always go back to this exact position where the mask will be at is to trigger this thing called keyframe. What this allows you to do is so that the editing software knows exactly where to put this mask. Uh, so when you return back the footage, it will always be there. And that's basically it. Do this for every single frame that you need to and repeat it as much as you need to. And from there, you basically got the effect that you want, which is um, a jumping or like a flying scene or whatever you need to do. That's basically it. That's how I and many people uh, remove rigs in posts when it comes to stop motion or any other type of uh, footage that you need to do. I hope that helps. You can also do this with any image manipulation software like Photoshop or GIMP by first importing the image with the rigs or export the images well, with the rigs from your video editor. And when you have processed the images, just re-import them back from your video editor or import them as a layer to mask the rig as a PNG file. And yes, while it's not the most efficient way to do it, the results speak for itself and if you're working with uh, no budget at all or just starting to learn the craft, it's a good basic know-how to learn for when you do decide to upgrade either to a better software or your own methods to accomplish this. Depending if your software allows you to do it, you can also make your own motion trail if you have the warp tool. Just like the name suggests, it warps the image for you to create amazing effects and especially if it's done right and at the right time. In Final Cut Pro, it's located right here. And although it has its limits, a simple warp tool is honestly enough for me to get the effects I want and if I do want something a little bit more precise. I can always bring the work over to an image editing software for the complicated stuff. But I don't really need this since the basic tool in Final Cut Pro provide is enough for me. But just to show you guys at home, here's how I would do it if I need to warp an image or do it all from scratch. I'll be demonstrating this using Adobe's Photoshop. So having an image that you can draw yourself using a stylus if you have one or just use the pen tool that's built into Photoshop. Um, this is of course optional or if you just found an image that you'd like or you feel that fits best, you can use that instead. And if you hover over to the top right side, there is like a warp logo symbol and it should tell you what it is and after clicking on it you should be able to manipulate it and warp it to any shape uh, or form that fits you best and for the best effect or better effect you can add motion blur or gaussian blur into it to make it look a little bit more realistic and feel like it's built into the image itself this is of course uh, optional and uh, does depend what you're, what type of look you're going for. So yeah, just have fun with it. 
And when you're done with that, you can repeat the whole process again for every frame that you need to do for consistency. And when that's done, just re-import those image files back to your video editor or video editing software and then just play it from there. There's a bunch of tools built into every editing software out there depending on what software you preferred and like. Basic things that are built into Final Cut Pro include things like Trail for Motion Trail, Gaussian or Gaussian Blur uh, to make things blend in, Directional Blur or Motion Blur for some of you out there. Uh, so whatever your preferred editing platform is, experiment and just make the most out of it. Next, let's talk about color correction. This is to balance out the color or manipulate the specific color temperature of the image so they don't look like they're tinted in a specific color. To put it simply, if your room, say, is green, your wall is painted in green or red or whatever color it is, whatever you film within that specific room will have a subtle wash of that specific color. So if your camera or filming software you're using doesn't allow you to change the white balance during filming, it's a good idea to fix it in your editing software. If you do notice your own video or footage has a tint of yellow or red or whatever color, it might be useful to go to your editor and dial it down. In Final Cut Pro 10, it's located right here. I'll either go to the midtones or highlight and bring it down a notch or two, till it looks somewhat neutral or where I want it to be. It might be difficult to catch all of them if you didn't set it right during filming, so keep in mind and set your white balance or color temperature, so you don't add more work in post or at least know how to fix them later down the line. That's how these videos are made in this channel. From the setup to the equipment I use, the usual process and any alternative tools and solution that I have tried in the past. With that, this concludes part 2 of the two-part video. If you were brought here from part 1, I want to thank you so much for watching the video and hope this video finds you somewhat useful or helpful to any degree. If it did, I hope you will consider dropping a like and maybe consider subscribing if you haven't already. And that's it from me. Um, take care, keep practicing, and I'll see you next time. Bye.